Hi there. Here I am again. This time, I'm going to take advantage of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that's happening in the heavens right now. has been all month long. And uh, so I want to talk about what that means first and then go into what I want to address today, which is the theme of light and shadow. And of course that's endless and one could go on and on. Uh, but let me just give you an example, um, very personal right now. I put this thing on, this is the light, because underneath, you see I have a chrome shirt on which has lots of stains. I'm always gonna do that. I'm always gonna wear something that is gonna cover up my stains, cover up my, you know, my old age, basically. And I, my sister told me once, one of my sisters said, old ladies wear orange because if you wear orange, you look like you're alive. <laughs> okay, so I want to start by, by, this, I went through an old journal. I'm going through an old journals, and this one is from 1998, or 1988, and I was um, very, I was trying to be with someone, a man. And uh, so this is what I say, hooked up to the man, especially the threat of a man getting close to me, letting him have access to my dark shadow side. Couldn't do that with dad, had to be perfect. I gave my perfection to him and secretly kept my vices to myself. So that's kind of the you know personal origin of the shadow and it's in everybody because we're all schooled to be a certain kind of way by by all sorts of things in our in our world whether it's parents or schools or um, peers we're supposed to be we're supposed to behave in certain ways and when we don't do it when we screw up um, then uh, bad things happen or that's what we're taught so um, that's that's a very good introduction to Saturn Pluto because Saturn, which has a cycle of 30 years, is the cycle that has to do with cultures, roles, rules, regulations, and so forth. I presume that if you're over 30, you remember 30 as being kind of a watershed point where you had to grow up, basically. It is time to grow up at 30. We all realize that. If you're over 60, it's like it's time to let go of your identity and to just um, be a crone or be an elder and just sit here and um, help people when they ask for it. And then um, beyond that is Pluto. Pluto has a 248 year cycle. Obviously way too long for us to complete one circuit, one full circuit of it. Way too long. It's more than twice as long as a lifetime. So three times as long as a lifetime. And Every 36 years or so, these two planets come together. The smaller cycle approaches the larger cycle and, and they come together in a certain sign. And the sign they're in now is Capricorn. And Capricorn is the sign that rules Saturn. So again, it has to do with forms, structures, rules, laws, regulations, and so forth. All the matter that culture and society creates these various structures, whether they're visible or invisible. Meanwhile, they do that, cultures do this to harness the life force, which is Pluto. Pluto has to do with nature. It has to do with the coming into form and the letting go of form uh, by inexorable laws, which we do not understand. Um, anybody who's trying to stave off death, for example, is trying to stave off Pluto, it's probably not going to work, or it's not going to work very long. Uh, because Pluto has to do with the, the coming into and going out of form of any being. And so it's, it's just this huge primal energy that's underneath all everywhere, all the time. And uh, so Saturn is like this thing that's trying to hold it in place, hold things in place, hold things so that they'll stay the same and they just don't ever do that. Uh, you could look at um, this culture right now as undergoing a very Saturn-Pluto experience with the impeachment uh, and with the uh, incredibly uh, polarized views of Donald Trump. 
either one hates him or one loves him. That seems to be the only two alternatives. Uh, and each time, for each one, the feeling is very, very strong. He's either horrible or he's wonderful. And really, if we look at that, let's look at that and take back the projection. In other words, those who can't stand him usually can't stand him because they say he's an egomaniac. So if we take back the projection, couldn't we say that we, we aren't comfortable with our own egos? We're not comfortable doing what he does. And he does it and he glories in it. But I think for him at this point, it's no big deal. It's just how he gets things done. I think he's using that part of himself. But at any rate, back to Saturn and Pluto. So Saturn would, would be the ego. It's the part of us that focuses energy, but the energy is always much stronger than what Saturn is able to focus. So you always find forms breaking down eventually. They, they just don't stay the same. They just can't stay the same. Okay, um, so another way to talk about the Saturn-Pluto process then, or the process of light, I wouldn't call it really light, but we think of Saturn as light in the sense of it holds things in place, so we, we illuminate the darkness with Saturn. We try to make it a certain sort of way. Uh, another way to talk about it is to um, give examples um, that are closer to home. So, for example, I just mentioned uh, I couldn't be myself around my dad. I mean, this is just a typical German Catholic childhood. That's all it was. But I absorbed it thoroughly and was a very, very good girl until I broke out, until my life force broke out, and it broke out during an, a, an attack of peritonitis. So I almost died. In other words, in other words, Pluto came in and said, okay, you're either going to live or die. And that was truly a voice that I heard in the room, live or die, it's your choice. And uh, so I entered the Plutonian world from the Saturn world from then on. And I've actually been there ever since. Now I work with Saturn as I play with Saturn, Saturn, all sorts of forms. There's all sorts of forms, all sorts of identities, um, all sorts of ways that we are with one another on as humans on this planet. Uh, but none of them are, are real. They're all things we make up. They're all artificial. And that's what Saturn has to do with is that artifice that we create, that we put as a scrim over nature. You could say that money is like a great example of Saturn. You know, we try to make it fair and have equal exchanges and all of that, but it's still Saturn's pretense that it is real compared to Pluto. Pluto is the reality of nature underneath that is constantly trying to be overwhelmed by Saturn and it can't be because Pluto's bigger. Okay, I wanna give um, two examples, I think, or is it just one? Two examples, yeah, two examples. One happened yesterday, a friend of mine who is having a hard time with her husband, her ex-husband, who's with another woman, and it's hard on the kids because she's having a hard time with him. And everything else in her life is just fantastic. And um, so we were walking with our dogs and I said, Mark, you know, why don't you think about what do you feel grateful for? Just enumerate all the things you feel grateful for first. So she did, she went on and on and on and on and on. I feel grateful for this and that, my house, my kids, my job, my, you know, the fact that I have all this alone time now, um, I'm feeling good about my body, on and on. She went on and on. And then I said, okay, so there's this little thing that you have with your ex-husband. Think of it as the growing point. Think of these situations which are critical, which we can't seem to figure out, which constantly take more than we've got from us. Think of them as growing points. So Saturn, you know, the Saturn is trying to hold it in place. He's trying to do one thing, she's trying to do another. They're trying to control each other's responses to the situation. Meanwhile, they both have these two beautiful children to raise. Uh, and they're you know, trying to figure out how to do it, obviously. And it's not easy, and you have to just kind of give up control, ultimately, to work with Pluto, and that is the key. And as you do that, you start to recognize more about your own life force. Another example is a friend of mine who 
who has a girlfriend who is wonderfully loving and kind and caring, except that once a week she goes berserk, completely berserk. And he never knows when it's going to happen. So he's gotten to the point where he can't trust her because he doesn't know if all of a sudden she's going to turn on him. And it's not like she wants to be like that. It's just there's a part of her that is unintegrated. And that part of her is huge. And she's trying to figure out how to work with it. So each of us has these parts which are unintegrated with the identity that we've created um, through everything that we're doing in our lives. And, um, you know, all the things people say that are good about us or bad about us. Um, either way, they're, they're what's showing up in the world. So now I want to give a personal example of back when I was um, in my 30s, in my 40s. And I was living in a community of yurts in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And... Um, Oh, it was a fascinating situation. Um, the, we had a community, there were like 10 different living yurts and maybe 15 people all together. And, um, you know, we were trying to, you know, work with our situation kind of like an anarchist community where nobody really uh, tried to lord it over anybody else. But it, eventually people did try to do that. Especially this one person did, or I thought she was doing that, because she had the books and she wouldn't let anybody see them. She wouldn't let anybody see them. I was like, what? No, I didn't think she was cheating or anything. It's just a, a matter of control. She wanted that control. And I started to get really, really pissed. I mean, I was, I was beside myself. I was so angry with her. And it went on and on and on and on and on and on. And I would go on my daily walks with my, my friend who lived there also. And I would just, you know, kvetch about her over and over again. And every time I'd walk by her yurt, I would just stiffen because I couldn't stand it. And couldn't, I knew she was looking at me and all of this. I mean, it was really bad. It was a typical polarized situation. And um, then I started to notice that this woman was also the first of eight children. She was also the first of eight children in a Catholic family. She was also about the same size that I am. She even had the same coat, the same winter coat, and the same um, bathrobe as me. Not only that, but we both kind of march. We march. We don't just walk. We march. So I was looking at myself in her. I was looking at all sorts of things about myself in her that were just, you know, some of them really trivial, like, you know, the winter coat and the, and the bathrobe and, and the, the way we walked. But what we had in common, which I couldn't stand about her, meaning I couldn't stand it about myself, it was a part of myself that was in shadow, was the controlling aspect. And I was just, oh my God. And when I recognized that, when I realized, oh my God, she's, I'm just, it's her. She's me. She's me. And so I've got to learn to neutralize this situation. I had to take back the projection of the shadow onto this woman. And I spent, I, I mean, truly, I was consciously intending, and that's the important thing, to intend in a very strong way, intending to take back this projection onto this woman. And I will never forget the day I went on my walk with my old friend, and afterwards, I noticed that I didn't feel that stiffening when I walked by her yurt. It was like, wow, maybe I've done it. Maybe I've neutralized it. Maybe I've dissolved the projection. And I told my friend, my God, I think it's done. I think it's, I think I did it. And you know that that very night, that very night, she and her husband picked up and left the yurt community. So I thought that was, wow. As soon as I completed it, it was done. So you go, okay, so what brought her there? What brought me there? 
Was that why we were there? Is that why we're there with, with each other? I mean, the timing of it was so exquisite. When we dissolve projections, something's going to change. We're the ones that have to change. And uh, I'm going to bring in a, to finish this, I want to bring in a, a Jungian quote. It's, I don't know if it's exact, but something I've always remembered, and it, it relates to this. He said, if you bring forth what is inside you, it will save you. If you don't bring forth what is inside you, it will kill you. So that's the first talk on light and shadow. I'll probably have a number of others. Thanks.